Hello, everybody. So healthcare is a quagmire and we all know it. So when you look through the slides over here, some of the initial slides, I'm going to go rather quickly because you can always look at the data later. And um, I think some of you are working exactly on the, some of the topics we're going to talk about. So that's good to know as well. So first and foremost, you know, you think that uh, with the internet and with uh, FaceTime, you all have your acronyms. Uh, we in our 80s and 90s had our own acronyms um, in terms of innovation. So if you think about RTB, GTB, and TTB, anyone wants to venture guess what those mean? They were the acronyms put forth by Meta Group, uh, which is no longer existence because it merged with Gartner, and it was basically run the business, grow the business, and eventually you'll have to transform the business because if you don't, you wouldn't be there to run the business again. So those are basically the, um, the acronyms over there. And um, as you all know, in terms of uh, what is an innovation, you have to first invent it, you have to adopt it, and then finally you have to diffuse it. And it has to be desirable to you know everybody. And herein, as you will see in the other slides, is when you come to healthcare, when you say usable and desirable, the question of to who, to when, and how become very complicated questions. One thing about innovation in healthcare, which always fascinated me during COVID, is we were looking at two completely contradictory ways of innovation, right? One was the fact that we had the, the first time the mRNA platform where you had no longer needed a pathogen to be able to, uh, to stimulate the responses. We actually had the mRNA, which was able to mimic the, uh, the, uh, the actions of a pathogen and give us the, uh, the vaccine that we needed. And at the same time, equally important, the way to basically look at innovation in COVID time was wash your hands with soap and water. So innovations can either be persistent, consistent, or change over that of time. The question we have to ask over here is, is healthcare really crying out for innovation? And the reason I mentioned about that is, uh, we'll first look a little bit about the macroeconomics of healthcare. We'll then understand about the market and business of healthcare and understand why healthcare is not like any other business where it's a zero sum game. Meaning if the manufacturer basically puts a price and he gets a profit over there, the consumer is spending the money and giving it to the manufacturer. It's not a direct line over there anymore. And last but not least, before we come to the innovation healthcare is the rather perverse economics which exists as well as the incomprehensible value chain which exists in healthcare. So macroeconomics, um, we all know the figures, right? 4.5 trillion over there, 17.3% of uh, GDP. And by the year 2020, it's going to be 20% of it, and you'll be paying the taxes for it. Um, the GDP growth in terms of healthcare, as you can see, consistently, the growth has been higher in that of healthcare, except for right now, where the GDP is basically overtaking it. But I have a question to ask you this. If, GD, if healthcare is 20% of GDP, anyone wants to fathom a guess how much defense spending is, as we talk so much about defense spending? It, yes, but what percent? It's 3%. So when you're talking about healthcare being 20% of GDP, whereas the defense is about 3%, the 776 billion is a correct figure, by the way. But it's a, a, the difference in factors which makes you understand how big a percentage of GDP healthcare is. And what has what makes up healthcare? As you know, it's the hospitals. You know, it is basically the private doctors. You also know it's where the wellness centers is, of course, the healthcare systems. It is the, the retail clinics. It is the pharmaceutical distributors. And keep in mind, each of those people has a lobby group. And we'll come to that later. In, and if you see over time what has happened is things are not always too bad, right? Because if you look way back in the 1970s, the hospital costs were way above the retail, right? It's not a bad thing if people are going to take more medicines and consume more in medicines and therefore reduce the hospital cost over there, which is what you're seeing going over time. But the figures don't represent completely the picture either. Now, if you look at it, the way you find out is that if you look at this figure, you're going to say, oh my God, I get it. You know, the per capita cost for the individual has constantly increased over time, right? So that's what we all know. Everybody's talking about co-pays, everybody's talking about deductibles and it's going in. But if you look at the actual percentage of the total uh, national health expenditures, what you find the difference is actually the out-of-pocket costs seem to be lower, right? As a percentage. But does that mean the person is paying less? No, because the healthcare itself has expanded to such a large extent. And now we come to the most important factor, right? It's okay to pay a lot. If I go to a very expensive dinner, I don't mind paying the high price because what I get is the ambience, the good food and all of that. So 
what are we seeing in the rankings? In almost every case, whether it's access to care or it's healthcare outcomes or it's equity in healthcare, we are close to the last among all of the modern economic growth, high income countries over there. And if you look at even further, the age adjusted mortality, what we find is we are doing rather poorly compared with all the other countries. So it basically tells you the market economics of spending and quality, which you normally see when you purchase a car or you purchase a phone is not exactly working in healthcare. So where is the waste? And I want you to look at these figures in terms of billions, because you had mentioned, right? 766 billion of entire defense care spending. Look at the wastage we are talking about. It is in billions because our healthcare costs happens to be in trillions. And if you want to see the breakup of that in a much more readable grammat in a graphical format, what you find is that 25% of healthcare is considered wasteful, right? It's either wasteful because you are have inefficient spending, you have administrative waste, you have operational waste, or you're basically getting care which is not providing you any benefit whatsoever. <laughs> and putting it in a very tangible way to you, you are paying $13,000 a year towards that waste. Now, if you look at business principles, if a market is growing, that's good for startups. That's where you should be investing. That's where really transformation and innovation is going to happen. But as you'll see in the graph in 2020 to 2022, you see a big downtick over there. Anyone wants to guess why? COVID was going on. So why was healthcare spending going down? It's important when you create a startup to understand the trend. When COVID is going on, the hospitals have shut down everything except emergency services. So no elective surgeries, no um, anything which was not an emergency was not basically going in there. And therefore there was a downtick in terms of healthcare because all that we were concentrating on is COVID treatment. And so if you want to dig deep into the economics of healthcare, I would suggest you go to this link. You have every way of slicing and dicing the data to basically tell you we are spending far too much, there is too much waste, and basically we are not getting what we need. So the question is, we know where the waste is, so what prevents us from basically fixing it? Because we have to understand the market of the business of healthcare, and that means health and care and everything in between. First and foremost, is healthcare a privilege? Should it be a privilege? The moment you ask this question, comes the question that means if it's not a privilege, it's a right. And if it's a right, it has to be for everybody. And once you start entering that, all of this time you were talking about hospitals, care, individuals, money, suddenly politics enters the domain. And you find the breakdown in terms of whether you consider it's a benefit or that if it's a privilege, um, depends very much so upon your socioeconomic status, because you're not going to know if you're a very wealthy person what it is not to have health care. It also depends upon your political views. So all of a sudden, between health and care comes politics, right center, and little of that. And so if you argue the fact that it is, in fact, a right, because every other country seems to have it, then comes the question of the following three statistics, which is directly based upon an individual's own choices, physical activity, alcohol abuse, as well as uh, cigarette smoking. So for those who want to sway on one side, look at these figures and they're not convinced whether it is a right or it's a privilege. So let's get back to who is the customer, right? Because we, one of the things we said is, how do we know who are we selling it to? So we have the employer, as you can see, that's the largest bucket over there. And that's very unique, right? Because after World War, Britain decided to take a completely different way. They decided the government shall be the provider as well as the financial administrator of that of healthcare. The United States took a different route and basically went to the blues, who in turn said, we don't need the government, we will work with the employers and take care of the 49%. Then we have the 20% of the Medicaid where we work with the state level and the Medicare, which is the elderly. So basically they said, we're gonna divide up the whole country into employed people insurance, older people insurance, and then disabled and poor people insurance, right? So that's how they decided to break up the market. And so over the years, over Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, we got the exchanges. And what we find is that there are still 3.5% of the people on the exchange and 3.5% of, of the exchange. So 
when we are talking a lot about healthcare, we are talking about the 3.5% of the individuals who are not covered, as well as those who are undercovered. And what I mean by that is when the levels of co-pays and deductibles become so high, what happens? We'll get to that. But the problem number one is we have too many customers because now you have the state government, the federal government, the employer, the blues, and other insurance companies. You also find the individuals not completely out of the picture because they still have to pay the individual amounts. And what happens when the individual starts paying is that you find that we have 100 million people, one third, are saddled with that of debt. The greatest cause of bankruptcy in this country today is because of healthcare. And the distribution varies with that of age as well as state because of the fact that it's not uniform how Medicaid is provided or how affordable care insurance is provided across all of the states. So when you go to, with a product and you're trying to sell, you've got to figure out also what are the dynamics within a state as well. I would like to say that, you know, uh, Don Berwick, whom I very much respect, one of the leaders in healthcare, he kind of said the moral test of a government is how the government treats those who are the dawn of life, that is children, in the twilight of life, that is the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of their life. Uh, those are the handicapped. So meaning in a certain way, the government has a right to be able to look at the health care of the individual. Having said that, and having have the greatest respects for Don Berwick, the question is how has Britain fared? I mean, they took that route, right? The government shall provide it. And what we do know by reading is, yes, no one is saddled with a big debt, but at the same time, if you are sick, you are, may not get the treatment in time. And there are long waiting lists for basic procedures which are over there, which basically tells you that it's a complicated business irrespective of whether the government is involved or not involved in there. Let's go to the question of healthcare is not a zero sum game, right? So there are two um, models. Um, the IHI AAA model is also by Don Berwick. And if you look into it, they're basically the population health, there's the experience of care and the per capita cost. And over time, we kind of said, well, that's not all healthcare depends upon. Healthcare also depends upon how does the individual feel? Have you done, have you provided the right care in the right setting in the right way, in the right manner, which means patient experience. And at the same time, having done that, how we left our doctors burnt out. So what happens to the clinic care time? And it's not just doctors, all clinicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, all of them. So the holy grail of healthcare in a certain way was put by the IHI, which is the health improvement uh, nonprofit, which basically said you have to be able to look at all of these things simultaneously and be able to provide the best care by not sacrificing one quadrant. But on the other hand, from the ninth, and this was basically more in the 80s and 90s, the IHI came about. And that is a framework and a concept, however, was the Iron Triangle. And the iron triangle basically says, you know what? You can only satisfy one or the other because you have the Congress, because they have to pass the budget. You have the industry groups. Remember those lobby groups I talked about initially by the various quadrants? Each of them wants a piece of the money. And then you have the bureaucracy, which is the various, whether it is the FDA who's doing very valuable work or the HHS, you have all of these bureaucratic organizations also looking into it. So there is no way it is basically possible to allow it to be equally distributed among all of the players over here. There are going to be strong players and people with a greater voice who are going to skew this particular triangle in a particular direction. So um, therein lies a problem that even the economists who put the iron triangle and the clinicians who put in the triple aim don't seem to agree on a common basis. <clears throat> if you look at the healthcare system over here, you know, this is no, I mean, even if you've never studied healthcare, you know, by the time you go into a doctor's office and get an x-ray and come back again with to the, your specialist who then turns it into your primary care doctor, who may actually send you to a prescription, there are multiple, multiple people in this healthcare ecosystem. What you also find is who controls what becomes a very confusing piece, right? I mean, is it the fact that the government basically mandates what happens to the doctors? Or is it the American Medical Association who provides guidelines to the government on how to act? What are the various pieces of data that you need? 
if I go to a primary care and I go to a specialist and I go to the drugstore, what are the various pieces and streams of data do I have and how do I manage it? Let's add to the further complexity. I go to Quest Labs and I go to Lab 4 and I get my H1AC, which is the level for my diabetes to be uh, obtained, and I get two different levels. Who arbitrates which is the right value? Who determines what is right for me? So therein lies the disparate players, the disparate goals, the disparate data, and the disparate approaches. And as you can see in this particular case, they have, you know, as much as they put the consumers in the middle of it, is the consumer really in the middle of it? Do they really have any control over all of these moving parts? Let's see. And so when you are looking at that ecosystem over there, what you have to look at is what regulation are you looking at? Um, so for example, if you are trying an innovation in a, in a new medicine, are you going to look at what the FDA is going to say? Are you going to look at what the private insurance company is going to do? Are you going to look at whether Medicare is going to approve the drug? And how are you going to influence or educate the physician to be able to prescribe the drug? And more important than others, I have a patient who's being paid by the employer per se to the insurance company. I have another person who's being by, paid by the federal government, which is the Medicare, and then I have the Medicaid. So what are the payment streams? And how do I look at all of the payment streams when they intersect the product that you are trying to deliver? Added to this equations, if you just thought these were the main healthcare ecosystem players, which were the hospitals, the physicians, the drug stores, now you have the newest acronym, which is in healthcare, which is not so new anymore, which is SDOH. Anyone wants to fathom a guess of what SDOH is? It's a social determinants of health, right? Where you're born, how you're educated, where you live, are you in Michigan with lead-based water? All of those become important factors in terms of your health. And now you have to look at it in terms of your product. Since you're in Pittsburgh, I figured I have to look at this um, question of IDFS, right? Because we invented the term IDFS. So IDFS stands for Integrated Delivery Financial System. So if you look at Highmark and AHN, they are in IDFS. If you look at UPMC and UPMC Health Plan, so basically what they're saying is we are mimicking the fact where the financial aspects of healthcare and the clinical health aspects of healthcare are merged. But therein it alone doesn't allow, arise a solution because what you find with the social determinants of healthcare is it is not just the question about the clinical and the healthcare, it is all the way from equity to access to education to the kind of housing you live in. And I will not go into this in detail, but if you thought that the players and the power plays between the various segments of in healthcare are, are powerful, when you go to SDOH, what happens is how do you prevent a two-tier system or even for that matter, a three-tier system where the very wealthy get one kind of healthcare, where the very poor get another kind of healthcare? How do you risk, avoid risk in this environment? I'll let you read this for a particular minute over here and basically summarize this into this graph. If you look at the future, it's not just the social determinants, but also the commercial determinants of health, as we all know. The, if our oceans are polluted, our fish which we are coming to us is polluted. If we have these, these uh, climate, total disarrays of climate, if I may say so, or where you have the floods which is going on in California and the drought which is going on in areas in terms of where you would always have rainfall, or you look at microplastics, then you also have to look that none of your innovations or none of your introductions of new products or services is going to affect the commercial determinants of health as well. This is probably the biggest problem in healthcare. And this is the perverse economics in healthcare and an incomprehensible value chain. If you buy an iPhone, and I alluded to this before, or if you bought a car, if you pay more, you get a better car. If you can't afford it, you buy a cheaper car. If you want a car with, uh, you know, uh, with uh, a longer mileage, that may be your choice, or a car which is more snazzy and dazzy, it's your personal choice over there. The government doesn't pay the manufacturers to say, I will pay you subsidies to make sure the quality of your steel is good because they know if you have a bad product, market economics will determine that your car is not going to be sold. 
And the pricing is also dependent upon the market. That's a normal in terms of economics of market products, which are sold over there. In perverse incentives are, think about it. If you get sick again and again and again, and you go to the doctor again and again and again, that means you're not getting better, but actually the physician, not that they are trying to make you sick, but the point is the economics works such that if you tend to overutilize the system, not necessarily get better care, but more quantity, less quality, that you're actually getting, uh, you're basically rewarding the system. So a good example of this is in McAllen, Texas. This is an example from long ago. It's a small area in Texas and Dartmouth Atlas, Atlas has been used as a way of comparing how healthcare quality goes. And it's been shown in the Dartmouth Atlas, it doesn't depend upon the area or the place, but if you, if you have an institution or a physician doing many of the same kind of services, you find the quality increases, obviously, because if you can do it over and over again, you've perfected the art over there. But in McAllen, Texas, the people were not more sick. It is not because of the fact the procedures were not there, but the level of heart disease treated and the number of procedures done were astronomical. And the reason was just one. It is because of the culture of the physicians over there. It was okay to overdiagnose and overtreat. And as Peter Drucker would say, culture eats strategy for breakfast every time. And in the case of healthcare, it wins over technology in healthcare. What did I do here? Okay. Now let's go to the incomprehensible value chain. When, what I mean by the incomprehensible value chain is, let's think about the employer, right? 49% of the insured insurance is by the employer. Employer buys your insurance for you, or you contribute to it, now more so than ever in the past. You go to a doctor, the insurance company pays the doctor, and you, the consumer, receive the treatment. If you chose to ignore your obesity, your alcohol, whatever it is, and you keep repeatedly going to the doctor, the insurance company is completely paying that. That doesn't happen in a car. If you bang up your car every time, you have to pay for it. The, the perverse economics in healthcare comes because the person who pays, the person who provides the service, and the person who's a recipient of the service, there is no information transparency between all of them. And as a result of that, you have a chaotic condition when you are introducing a product. So if you come up with the greatest invention and the insurance company is not going to cover it, you're not going to be able to make it. If you have the greatest invention and you are not going to be able to convince the physician that it's not going to take too much of his time to learn this new technology and adapt it, it's not going to make it. And if you basically go to the consumer as the DTC market, the the retail pharmacy market is doing because only in this country can you advertise directly to the consumer in terms of pharmaceutical drugs. In most of Europe, you cannot do that, right? Whether it's Nexium, the purple little pill or whatever it is, we are able to do it. What happens? The consumer still has to go to the physician and say, hey, I saw that on TV. What do you think? And the physician is going to say, well, I don't know if it's covered under your insurance. So the whole value chain is, is splintered, it's broken, and there is no transparency across the board. So having said all of the negatives over there, can we really have innovation in healthcare? So um, McKinsey gives you basically, you aspire, you choose, and the most important things are aspiration and choice. And then you go through the discovery, evolution, acceleration, and extension and mobilizing of it. Let's go quickly towards some of the areas of innovation. Precision medicine. More and more, we are realizing that we are not treating the disease, we are treating the individual. That means at an individual level, you have to look at the disease risk, prevent the disease, find the disease, and target treatments. A lot of people have called this personalized medicine, individualized medicine, P4 medicine, uh, stratified medicine. Precision medicine is probably individualized medicine, but it's not necessarily personalized medicine, right? Because Individualized medicine is based upon the genetic components of what is needed. Personalized medicine is, depends on your lifestyle. I may not need the drug if I'm not climbing mountains. And therefore, precision health is expanding, but simultaneously what you're finding is that 
Precision Health is combining with alternative medicine, for example, acupuncture, for example, with um, meditation. And therefore, we're getting into a larger concept of what is integrative medicine. And when you look at integrate, for, for example, you are in cancer, believe it or not, Slow Slow and Kettering had a center which was called the Donna Karen Center of Meditation for its cancer patients, similar to Duke as well, which has the same thing. So it, what you're finding in medicine is you have to know about the pieces of medicine which are not necessarily inside your own silo because they all intersect in some way, someplace. Inpatient, inpatient treatment is very expensive, right? I mean, that's the highest cost of where you can provide the service. So if you can move it to the outpatient, and eventually what you can hear at is the hospital at home, which I'm not even touching in this talk, but look up about that. Uh, Mayo Clinic is doing a lot of work on that hospital at home. Then you are reducing the costs, right? So the, what are the ways that you can prevent hospital care? Prevention, right? If I don't get you to the point that a person has diabetes and they need an amputation, but I can basically get the H1AC levels under control by constantly monitoring them, that's one way of reducing the hospital. The second way of doing it is coming up with innovations, which are, so for example, an orthopedic surgery doesn't need to be done in a hospital. It can potentially be done in an ambulatory outpatient center. So the question is, yes, can we reduce the cost of care by moving from an outpatient to an, sorry, from an inpatient to an outpatient to finally at home. That is the holy goal. And if you can actually prevent by utilizing any of that, by looking at good health, then you achieve all that you needed to achieve. So if you look at innovation and finding new drugs, it's a very difficult, arduous process, right? I mean, it takes about a billion dollars and it takes about 10 years, but we've come up with great cures. I mean, this particular um, is, a, I and mean, we'll come to CRISPR again, which is basically gene editing. Amazing, the first drug which is covered by the FDA, which, which solves the sickle cell anemia problem. What's the cost per dose? 3.5 million. Who is going to be able to afford it? Even if Boston Medical Center, which has agreed to actually provide this free of cost to individuals, for how long? That becomes a problem. And it's not just which are, which, you know, um, not only gene therapies, which are that expensive. The most common medicine, which everyone from Hollywood to the common man wants to go after is the GLP-1 medications, right? Whether it's for diabetes or for weight loss. And who is going to be able to afford $1,000 a month for one medication going in the long run? So... Yes, we have innovation, but how do we lower the cost of that innovation? One particular way is being suggested is quantum computing. So yes, you're talking about AI, but they're talking about the marriage of AI and quantum computing, which basically can take enormous large of data sets and able to slice it and dice it to come up with new innovations. But come with new innovations comes problems, right? When CRISPR editing went around, there was a physician in China who tried CRISPR editing in the embryo to prevent disease of the, uh, the diabetes. But what if he introduced yet another disease in the process? So as you have these new opportunities, you have to have guardrails. Guardrails which tell you that you're doing it ethically, you're sharing your information. There is educating everybody in the organization or what the implications are because of the innovation. And you also look at the cost benefit, not only in economic terms, but also in terms of the impact on the end consumer. New technologies, as you had indicated, yes, will reduce the, uh, the cost quality conundrum by going more into the ambulatory center. Somebody was creating robots in healthcare. Yes, especially if you've gone to the dentist, uh, you know now, it's, it's commonplace, right? I mean, no longer do you have, um, Sorry, uh, uh, you not. I shouldn't say uh, in the dentist world, but if you go, for example, in an orthopedic surgery or so on, you have the Da Vinci surgical robots who are basically providing it. In terms of providing companionship and wellness, that's become a major effort in terms of robots being providing um, help, uh, providing help in terms of robots. And also, if you have 
very severe infections and you want to provide very toxic chemicals or UV to clean it, robots do the job there as well. Another way is in terms of the robots is the fact that the local company, Aton, which provided the delivery because you know labor costs are very high. So if they can deliver what is needed to the every floor in terms of the um, supplies which are needed, the Aton tug has been a very positive uh, robotic introduction into that of healthcare. And you were talking about AI and absolutely, I mean, without AI, I mean, a lot of, they've actually combined the hardware and the software in the in systems, especially with the computer aided diagnosis in mammograms. So it really is the first front line of catching minutiae tumors. And it's been found that if you have AI, think about it. If I have a good doctor, I have one good doctor. If I have an AI engine, which is able to marry the the intellectual uh, wisdom of very experienced doctors and combine it into the AI, then every individual gets that very experienced input into their, their, their cancer. And which is why what you're finding is that in certain terms of lung cancers, that the, the AI engines are far more superior to any physicians who's living on earth today. However, the same thing can be also a negative. So Medicare, which was just recently introduced saying, hey, Medi you know, Medicare said insurance companies cannot use AI to basically um, determine whether a person can get coverage or not, right? Because of pre-existing illness or whatever. They basically said you have to use the individual's only information because the biases that could be introduced because of AI could be very large. AI is extraordinarily useful in uh, low-income countries because, you know, previously it was like the low-income countries had to deal with infectious diseases and we had to deal with chronic diseases. And what I mean by chronic diseases is diabetes, congestive heart failure, CDK, um, COPD, lung diseases, kidney diseases, heart diseases, all of those. But now all countries have to deal with the same thing. However, in low-income countries, they don't have the resources for individuals to do the actual coaching, the detecting, the con continuous um, monitoring of all these diseases. So AI is becoming very in important in these countries, but it cannot be an isolated solution. It has to be a platform. And what you need are open blocks, and you need to have a service layer, and you have to have the various pieces combining together. So for example, if you go into a low-income country, where doctors are far in between and you have, have caregivers going in, they could have an app. Actually, Microsoft has an app where they can take a blood sample and using the camera, be able to detect whether somebody has malaria or not, right? But that means that information has to be fed into an infrastructure and then percolated across the board to where other people are able to use the learnings and also use the same engine and also understand, okay, if this person has malaria, what else do they have? Do we have them to treat them for other diseases as well? So AI is not an engine, but rather it's a tool in a toolbox, which has to be on top of an entire infrastructure. Generative AI. I mean, there's a lot to say about this. And it's in my, if you look at my reference section, I'll, 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 I'll let you read about it because yes, you know, in terms of um, education, in terms of being able to coach a patient, all of those are great. But the Hill, which is a, a, a political paper, could pick up only one thing, right? They basically came up with a report, which is actually true. The 83% of the pediatric cases, which were basically looked at by chat GPT, were found to be wrong, right? So that's, it's just an illustration to say, if you're not ready for release, don't release it because the political arms will come about it and try to squash it, even though... That's not how ChatGPT was supposed to be used. It was supposed to be used in conjunction with a doctor who reviews the results, looks at the context, and basically determines how it's going to be used. Is ChatGPT, by the way, ChatGPT did finish, uh, it did successfully pass the board exams and also finished the, um, the specialization in radiology and in, um, I, forget, I forget what other specialty, but it did uh, fail in oncology. Uh, but it did pass a lot more board exams than a lot of physicians do. So I do think there is a 
potential for this, but it has to be done, as we said, with the guardrails in consideration. This is to your question, right? How do we make sure that everything happens in the outpatient clinic? And that means how do we basically strengthen the primary care process so that we catch things early? We are able to look more in terms of a prevention rather than a cure and do that while we know in this country, primary care doctors are losing money. They are not able to spend the time with the physicians, et cetera. Here is where what you're finding is the marriage of technology, expertise, and process innovations which are occurring through companies like Firefly. They are basically saying, okay, if we, if doctors don't have the time and we have a technology platform which can monitor the results of the patient over time, so we're not looking at them just when they're unhealthy, but throughout the time, we could recommend, so, okay, this person's H1AC level is bad. Let's send him to a primary care person who knows more about diabetes than COPD. And then if need be, connect him to the specialist that's needed. So we don't have isolations of outpatient care, inpatient care, and the pharmaceutical and lab work, but rather can we combine it all? And sure enough, if this person happens to break his leg, he will still have to go to the hospital and get it fixed in a hospital. But can we do a lot of the work we do today in a cohesive fashion to focus more on prevention than in the cure process? So primary care transformation is a hot topic, not easy. But it is an area where you are trying to keep the person at home for a large time. And at the same time, you have one quarterback who's dealing with all of your problems rather than having a system which is treating you body part by body part, right? Oh, kidneys are bad. Let's go to the kidney specialist. My lungs are bad. Let's go to the lung specialist. And what if the two medications given by the kidney specialist and the lung specialist happen to have an adverse event? Who's going to be the quarterback over there? So that's where you're finding the primary care transformation going on. Coming to the areas of it, I figured who else better to ask in the World Economic Forum as to where the greatest innovations are. So they first talked about CRISPR gene editing. We've talked a little bit about this. We've talked about how the first drug was being able to create using that. And it is true. All these days we were trying to target um, gene therapies. We were never trying to basically change the genetic composition by editing it. And so this is a, basically is going to have a very high I think, impact on society going further. The question is going to be, who can afford it? <coughs> VR and AR, maybe Joe Facebook just released its, uh, you know, Google Glasses. And uh, this technology is becoming important in terms of more in mental health, right? So when you want to be able to coach people or get people to be in a calmer state of mind, or you're trying to get them into an environment which is a safe space, AR is really booming. The other place, of course, where it's also very helpful is it's for surgeons to be able to um, be able to look at a particular organ and decide which route to should I go. Should I go to the front or should I go to the back? In terms of surgeries, the AR VR is also becoming very exceedingly important. Bandages. I mean, I have to admit this. When I saw this, my, my heart sank because in 1990, when I gave the talk, so I'll date myself. I had the same slide at that time. It was not by Stanford, but it was by Scripps who talked about, you know, what, what if we have smart bandages so we don't have to open it and we can actually have uh, microsensors on them so we can, uh, we can basically be able to look at it from outside. Yes, it's a great, great idea. The question is diffusion. Can, can I buy a bandaid out of Rite Aid or is this going to be available for everybody? Or is this going to be available only in certain conditions? And if so, who is going to have access to it? 3D printing. Somebody else came about with 3D printing. Um, just before this, as I was telling Allison, I was listening to, I'm involved with UNICEF in more than one way. And it was rather eye-opening as well as very, very heart-wrenching to realize that UNICEF is putting a lot of money into um, 3D printing because of the number of children whether it's Sudan or Ukraine or Gaza who are losing their limbs, that they are finding that this 3D printing is going to be the only way they're going to be able to target over there. And this is where I meant to talk about the dentistry as well. I mean, most of us know if you go get our teeth right now, 3D printing is how they're basically doing all of the implants in terms of that of surgery over there. Also, it's not just the treatment aspects of it. Medical equipment is also 
uh, utilizing more and more of 3D printing in terms of going there. And just as we're using VR and a uh, AR in terms of surgeons operating, surgeons are also creating 3D um, printed objects to basically practice before they go into that of a surgery as well. So 3D printing is also very much expanding. Since I own a Tesla, I could not help but ignore the brain computer interface. And the other part, of course, as you know, University of Pittsburgh has been one of the greatest places where they have done the research during the Obama years um, in terms of taking, you know, how do you basically trigger uh, the brain computer interface? So they took, a, the, but this is how a paralyzed individual was able to move his arm because of the way they had um, done the clinical trials uh, on actually monkeys before in terms of coming up with brain computer interfaces. And it's not just Neuralink and Tesla who's in the field right now. You have multiple companies who are there because you're finding the level of Parkinson's disease, the level of stroke, um, the level of um, uh, dementia. All of these are increasing so much that the brain computer interface is becoming another area of um, quite intensive uh, research at this particular point. Not still a solution, but definitely a research area. Having said that, you know, uh, for someone who has been in healthcare since 80s, I would say, we, you know, some of us just kind of laugh about it, right? Google came into healthcare, Google died on the vines. Microsoft came into healthcare, Microsoft died on the vines of healthcare. Um, then basically came Amazon, right? I mean, so basically they tried to get into healthcare and they joined forces with Berkshire Hathaway and uh, JP Morgan to try to come up with healthcare. But every time they have failed, it's not because of lack of technology. It is not because of lack of money, but because in healthcare, what you're doing is really changing the wings of a plane in flight. You have to understand everything around you, the ecosystem, the monetary aspects of it, the regulation, the physician's cultures in terms of change and how overworked they are when you're going to add another new technology or innovation, which is going to increase the amount of time that they are going to um, basically spend in the office rather than being able to uh, address the patient, all of those things were not taken into consideration. So actually Google Health has been pretty clever about it, right? So they kind of said, got it, we understand, we don't understand the this ecosystem, but we know our AI, so let's focus on AI. And in fact, they have now the new glasses where if you wear the glasses, it'll tell you whether you have diabetes or not, right? Um, the same thing, Amazon kind of says, I understand marketplaces. So guess what? We now know that the pharmacy infrastructure is so complicated, right? You have the drug manufacturers. Then you have groups which are called the drug distributors. Then you have the retail. It's like, what is the distributor doing? Why does the hospital have to buy from the distributor and not from the manufacturer, right? So Amazon is actually buying licenses for pharmacies all over the country. So what they are realizing is that you can't tackle this healthcare in a whole. Can I take one little piece and try to understand that? And that's where the larger companies are going into it. And I think we've basically talked about it, a lot of this, but to summarize, right? The cost of failure is very high. It's not like you have a broken car. You have a, you could have people dead. You could have multiple people dead. Um, the cost, the too many intersecting domains. There are domains which range all the way, as we've said, with the SDOH and CDOH, which are government regulations to government financing to independent players. And you know, a lot of people like to throw, oh, the healthcare is plagued by malpractice suits. True. Court reform needs to occur, but it's not that big a percentage in terms of healthcare costs as people would like to make it out to be. And is healthcare global? Well, climate control is global. Is it um, local? Yes, because Medicaid is local. And if the water in your local district is bad, that's a problem. So how do you design something which is going to be used for, excuse me, <laughs> global and local as well as international rules. Having said it's all of those, if you think about doctor's offices until now, you can almost compare it to pizza joints, right? They're all small, siloed, individual mom and pop operations. They literally had to be pushed to be able to get digitized and use the electronic health record. And that's what I meant by government had to pay them subsidies, right? I mean, this is what I said, in, this, in the car industry, government doesn't provide subsidies to use better steel. But we had to do it in healthcare because you're all siloed in that nature. We know the value chain is complicated and the regulation is constantly changing, right? 
I mean, first it was like, yeah, we don't want errors. We want to be able to have technology. Oh no, chat GPT causes too many errors. So there's a constant change of, of regulation. And not only that, you have to educate the Congress. You have to, because if you don't educate the Congress, they are not going to release funds in terms of the budgets which are involved for the various institutions. Because remember, a majority of our hospitals are nonprofit hospitals. However, that does not mean that success has not occurred. It's occurred in every scope, right? I mean, Gavi, which is the, it's a private public partnership. Gates Foundation contributes to it. Um, you know, a, a lot of individuals have of high wealth have, including uh, McKinsey Bezos has contributed to it. They have achieved the marks of vaccination of children around the globe. They have transcended over the local, global, international. And, and remember, this is not a single person paying. It's in some places, the countries don't even have money to buy it. And they've had to rely on grants like a Gates Foundation. But they have cracked the code in terms of providing impactful global solutions. I mentioned about UNICEF. You know, one of the, uh, the technologies, apart from using 3D printing, the first ones to experiment with drones was UNICEF because the governments were employing them not for their money, not for their food, but they said, we know your logistics is so excellent that during COVID time, that whether you were the indigenous tribes of Andamans or you had to go to Borneo and drop off medications, they were able to use every type of technology, including drones, to drop off medications and be able to conquer the logistical war, in addition to doing all the basic things that they have to do, which is educate, feed, and provide vaccines for the children over there. It is not just national nonprofit organizations which have been successful. I'm standing here because of Ginny, who was supposed to have given you the talk, and her company is called MedRespond. Let me tell you what MedRespond was and is. So normally when you go to the doctor's office, before you get your surgery, the doctor has to tell you what's going on, what happens. You get your surgery and then you go home. And then you have to know what you need to do. How do you take care of yourself? You know, can I bathe? Can I sleep on my side? Okay, all of those questions over there. And so it was individual nurses who went through the process of telling the person who's already is so nervous about the surgery. So in a half an hour time, you're educating the patient. This is what's going to happen to you. And they have the surgery and now they've forgotten everything that they heard over there and they go home and what are they going to do? Call the doctor's office or call the nurse. In terms of labor costs, it's extraordinarily high, right? So there was a technology within Carnegie Mellon which was called synthetic interviews, right? So um, MedRespond licensed the technology called uh, synthetic interviews. It, it, it it's, it, if you think about it in modern days, you can think of it as um, the early days of chat GPT. That's the way I would say it. But it's not chat GPT, right? Because in chat GPT, it has access to global information. In synthetic interviews, you had its own domain knowledge, which it needs to access to. So synthetic interviews was a combination of natural language processing, okay? Crowd sharing, okay? And video splicing. So let me explain what that means. So let's take the video of the person giving the coaching, right? So I gave this lecture to this person before they had the surgery, but after surgery, they may have forgotten only the part which said, what kind of antibiotics should I avoid, right? They don't have to listen to it all the way from the beginning to the end. The patient can go on the web and you can watch one of these and say, um, what antibiotic cannot I use, right? So the system basically takes that, convert, uses the natural language in process over there, goes to the domain knowledge and basically says, and I'm going to give you a medically wrong information because I'm neither a doctor in person or on TV. And basically says, so you cannot take um, uh, Cephaflex, okay? Cannot do that. And so you had the video splicing because it takes that particular narrow splice of the video. And guess what? What if that video features your doctor or your own nurse? That's where the catch is. You've now trusted because you've a trusted individual. Then you have, after the video splicing, to say people who asked you what kind of antibiotic do not want to use also asked, when can I go back to work? So that's the crowdsourcing. So it comes back to another segment of the video saying, okay, you know, you've taken your antibiotics and you will now want to know about work. Here is another, you know, here is what other people are asking questions related to the question which you're asking. So that's crowdsourcing. So it's a combination 
of all the three pieces, natural language processing, video splicing, as well as crowdsourcing, which gives a personalized, customized, on-demand education for the consumer. Having said that, innovation in non-clinical areas, which target more in terms of um, lowering the labor costs, increasing the, uh, the efficiencies, definitely tend to be easier innovations to deal with than not, right? So a lot of people may start with these before they go into the clinical side, which has far more um, complicated impacts as well as the costs in terms of failure. So in fit for surgery, how do they know it worked? So they had two groups, right? Some of them got the MedRespond app, app, which was given to them through their MyChart, which is their portal, and the other group did not get it. And what they found is that because they had access to it, they, for those of you who are new in healthcare, Medicare basically says that if you get readmitted for the same cause again, sorry, previously they used to pay for it. Now they kind of said, hey, if I give my car for repair and you break the windows just because you fixed my tires, you know, you're not going to agree to it. So why should we as an insurance company allow hospitals to fix one thing and break the other thing, right? So what they found is that in open heart surgery patients, they had 50% reduction in post-discharge costs. They had 30% reduction in um, 180 days. So it's more like six months. And the patients were engaged. It's not like they said, I'm bored. I don't want to use it. They used 90 minutes in terms of the application. So it obviously it had the ability to um, give the individuals the information they needed when they wanted it, how they needed it, in a way and language that they could understand it. So the patient improvement scores went up to 99%. So yes, they had to deal with who's gonna pay for it, who's the end consumer, so how do we get the end consumer to like the product? How do we get the physicians to tend, spend the time to give it to the patient? And how should the nurses and nurse practitioners not feel that this technology was somehow gonna replace them? Because some of their work has been transferred over to an app. All of those facets had to be basically included in terms of looking at a product. I also want to let you know, as much as it seems complicated, do go to this list because there are thousands of companies who have reached the 1 billion mark, okay? The other unicorns, whether it is Devoted Health or Olive Health or in Finance or ZocDoc, which is my way of explaining open table for reserving your doctor. These companies have basically reached a billion dollar valuation. And um, one company I wanted to take into consideration because they come across in many, many intersections of people who think it's uh, rather clever of them to have gotten to where they are is Hinge Health, right? So Hinge Health basically deals with, the, and me being a part of the growing populations who is heading towards Medicare, the muscul musculoskeletal problems become more and more of a problem over there. And the cost to the insurance company is increasing. So what Hinge Health has basically done, apart from the fact that they are valued at $6.2 billion, in how many years? Eight years. 2015 was their start date. And, um, and they basically had nine rounds of financing. What they have done is basically come with a very clever approach of using technology, being able to work with the consumer, be able to provide their treatment in terms of the consumer, provide the information and education bite size and convince the insurance company it is worth paying me because I am saving you costs in the long run. And so that's just one example of Hinge Health. You have a company out of Sweden, which is called Sword Health, which is also trying to do the same thing over here. But it's a good thing to note that as much as there are complications and as much as there are problems, it doesn't mean people have not cracked the code. So what have they done? Design thinking, right? Think in a bigger scale in terms of it's consumer focused, but how are you going to work with the intersecting building blocks of getting to that end consumer? Because a consumer is not necessarily paying for it. You have to isolate a single problem, right? Hinchel didn't say, I'm going to look at everything. I'm going to look at COPD and CHF and everything else. I'm going, or they respond for that matter, right? They didn't say, we're going to do coaching for everything. You go to a single problem and you dig deep, but that doesn't mean that you don't spread your tentacles to understand all of the other pieces which touch this deep 
knowledge which you are gaining. You have to understand the impact of the ecosystem, right? So for example, if Ginny had not wondered about how she's going to convince the physicians to recommend the product, no matter what a bigger product she had, she could not give it to the consumer at the other end because they would not know or trust her for that process. You have to understand your revenue streams. So in this case, is it because of insurance reimbursement? Is it a grant? Is it because the physicians are, you know, uh, are, are the hospital is going to pay you as a, as a product that they're going to buy to improve their brand, to improve their, their competitive advantage? You have to understand that. You have to think global, but you have to act local because all healthcare is local, right? Your local doctor is here. Your local insurance company is here, but you have to. And last but not least is if you think you have a problem and you're not making headway, reframe the problem, right? So if it's, it's not a question of saying, um, let me give you an example of this. It's not a question of saying like the insurance companies try to do, right? They would in the 1990s pay for amputations, right? But they would not pay you for diabetes education. Duh, why don't you save, the, you wanna save costs, then change it around, pay for the education, pay for the drugs which are involved in controlling your diabetes and you don't have to worry about the amputations. Don't try to come up with a bigger solution for amputation, but rather look at the solution of how you look at the prevention. So that's a whole question of reframing the problem. And as we've said before, the clinical side of uh, innovation is far more complicated than the revenue cycle. And what I mean by revenue cycle is the monetary pieces, right? So there's a company called Lean Tas. Nobody's heard of it. But if you look at them, all that they have done is taken um, engineering principles of how to create operational efficiencies in hospital ecosystems, right? Right from the point of operating rooms, to where the tug goes and delivers all the uh, supplies to the, to the doctors. And that's a unicorn too. So sometimes starting with the revenue cycle, understanding healthcare, and then moving to the clinical side also allows a knowledge uh, immersion process, which helps you get to the final goal. And today's Valentine's Day. And I figured, you know what? If you love your startup, you gotta keep loving your startup and you gotta keep fighting for it. And that's the way you go there. So I think we have a few minutes for questions, maybe. Yep. So I'm, this is a bit of a niche question, but I'm interested in the QML that you talked about. Like, so what have you seen so far in terms of like near term impact for quantum computing in healthcare? We're still like well, ways away from like real. We're impact. still ways away, and it's probably going to start the research organization, right, which has funding from NIH. Uh, before, and you may not see the impact until diffusion occurs. So let me give you an example, right? Most people don't realize that when their mammograms are read these days, it is basically being read by the hologic component of the imaging device itself. So sometimes it skips, it skips the normal process of going to the physician. So the research goes into, so the AI model may work with a device company who encapsulates it in the device and hands it over to a physician, right? So it could go through that process over there. But any of those products will have to go through publications, affirmations, adoptions, and, and basically a certain amount. So we are there. I mean, we are still, we are looking at, I would say, if you look at CRISPR, it's probably CRISPR is far ahead compared to QML at this point, right? QML is still, we're still trying to understand how can it be used? How can you come, even if it's for drug discovery, right? How do we take the data sets and come up with a new NCI, new chemical uh, you know, um, investigative compound? And how do we use that to create a drug? So there's still lots of barriers in terms of understanding the final goal, but it's going to definitely hasten up the per process at which point the pharmaceutical company can say, because if you look at pharmaceutical companies nowadays, they're buying a biotech companies. They are not coming up with the main innovations themselves. So that may be a way for them to invest in those products to enable the biotech companies to come up with products quicker and cheaper in the, in the in ahead of schedule. The other thing is, <clears throat> Uh, until you had genetic therapies, what you were finding in the 2000 range of the market is we were going back to 
for example, aspirin and salicylic acid. We're going back to olden textbooks to figure out what drugs to come up with new medicines than with new therapies. What they believe is that this will provide a new input in terms of figuring out how do I not go through the costly process of phase one, phase two, and phase three trials? I can kill the product and make the product grow by understanding the impacts right to the phase one trial itself. See, the, 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 the problem is with hospital at home, you need two things, right? You need technology because you need to be able to monitor the patient at home. You also need to be able to have pristine conditions. So if you look at infectious diseases, et cetera, so when you have low-income countries, if you have multiple families living in a small real estate, that's going to be a problem, right? But there are other intermediate solutions, which is not exactly hospital at home, but which, for example, France has done a brilliant job of, and Chicago tried to experiment with it. So they said, why are these ambulances basically transport devices? You take a patient from home and you bring them to the hospital. What if you equip your ambulance with all of the needed technologists and the medical help, even if the medical help is going to come as via telemedicine, to take care of those situations and leave the patient at home and only take the very, very sick people to the hospital? That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it, and I believe this was in... I forget the city in the United States, but it's a place where you have um, a large amount of chronic disease problems among uh, socially disadvantaged people. So in that case, they said, why are the ambulances just going around the city? What if you went to the elderly person and did the education and did the blood pressure, I mean, the blood pressure checks and the, and the blood checks for whether they have diabetes or not? So why don't you create these ambulances to be able to take healthcare to the patient rather than take the patient to healthcare. So the in-between models of hospital at home have been more successful in non-US countries than here. But taking the entire hospital to the house requires pretty sophisticated visiting nurses, requires very, and as you know, nursing in this country is at, um, how shall I explain it? Nurses are capable and educated to take much more critical tasks than they are in other countries. And as a result of which you can send in a visiting nurse and take the comedian levels or do whatever it is that may not, even though you have a larger workforce in some of the poorer countries, which is why that AI framework, if you build up over there, then you would be able to do more of the processes through AI in the developing and low-income countries. Anything else? I know we have not touched on a whole segment of mental health, but then we need about four hours. As it is, I know I spoke pretty fast, but I figured you'll have the slides. Um, uh, but if, you know, there are so many other facets that you have. We have not talked about wellness. We have not talked about uh, how insurance companies are no longer <clears throat> financial companies, right? A lot of the care management is coming in from your insurance company. At the same time, doctors are not just in clinical care. They are billing you directly for your copays and deductibles. So there's a blurred line between what are exactly clinical organization and what are financial organizations. And that is also a change which you have to look in the future because more and more money is going to come directly from the consumer, which is not the case as it is today. Anything else? Good. Thank you for being such patient listeners and um, good luck in your startups. <laughs>